class action settlement agreement <coughs> prevented the survivors who started the lawsuits from being able to go to court to testify in front of a judge and to put in the public sphere their story of what happened to them in the schools. And because of that, we ran a great risk of people not knowing about residential schools and what happened there. And our concern was, as a commission, is if people don't understand what happened, if people don't understand the magnitude of the impact of the experience on those who were there, then they will never appreciate the importance of doing something about this. And the survivors themselves are the ones who funded this commission. The budget for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out of the Compensation Fund. We are not a government program. We're a survivor-created program. They wanted this commission because the survivors have told us they don't want to spend all of their time walking into their future backwards. It's important for these stories to be made known. But at the same time, we have to be able to turn around and look forward and ask ourselves now, what do we do about this? How do we fix this? What do we do that will make things better for the future? But the question is, what is it that we're trying to fix? Is it only the healing of the individuals who are there? If that were the case, then some can heal, some can't heal. Some don't want to heal, some want to live with their anger. Some want to just be able to be left alone. They don't want to be reminded of this. Remember, 7,000 have spoken to us. Another 37,000 have filed their claims, and we'll get those stories recorded in some way or other. But the other 30,000 people who could have come forward to tell their stories have not. It is because they probably, for the most part, choose not to. It's too difficult for many people, far too difficult. You saw how it was for Paul when he spoke. You heard what it was that he said. And he's a strong man. He's able to talk about his story, but others can't. But that, those stories are reflective of the kinds of things that we've been hearing and the impact that it's had upon the lives of those people. Those who were in residential schools suffered uh, significant, in many significant ways. But even if they weren't physically injured at the schools, as I've told you, they still suffered from the fact that they were denied their culture, denied their language, denied access to any, anything that would give them a sense of pride or a sense of self. All societies, every single society in the world, teaches their children how to be good people. Every single society does it. All Aboriginal societies did as well. And the teachings of every society are designed to answer four questions. The first one is, where do I come from? And that question is not just, how did I get born, mummy? How did I get inside your tummy? That question is also about, where do my people come from? What is our history? And it's also, what is our creation story? That's part of that question as well. And we all have creation stories. I didn't know until I was 36 years old what <coughs> my people's creation story was. But we have one, and it's a beautiful story. And it doesn't talk about the Garden of Eden. It doesn't talk about Adam and Eve. It's a different story than the story of the Bible. But it's a true story. And the story in the Bible is a true story, too, because everybody's creation story is true. Everybody's creation story is true. And that's a teaching about respect. And those who ran those schools did not respect our creation story. As a result of that, that part of our education as children, that part of our teaching as children, was taken away from us. And my family, my grandfather, my grandmothers, my dad, my aunts and uncles, who have all passed away now, they never learned our creation story in their lifetime. And I think that's sad. I think that's sad. 
they had a creation story, but it was something else that they were given in those schools. But they didn't know our creation story. The other question that we have to answer for ourselves is, where am I going? Not only where do I come from, but where am I going? And that's about future. It's about ambition, it's about responsibility, it's about where are my people going, what are my wishes for my people, what are my wishes for myself, what do I want to be when I grow up? But it's also about what happens when I die. It's about the spirit world after you leave this earth. That's an important teaching. Every society has teachings about that. We have teachings about that. Our own teachings are very unique and they're true teachings. The third question is, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? My name is Inigijik. means pictures in the sky. There's a teaching around my name. There's a teaching around your name, too. You should learn the teaching of your name because it's influenced who you are. It's a reflection of your family or by your family or your ancestors about what they were asking of you. And that one, Mizenegizhik, pictures in the sky, is that they wanted me to be one who spoke about things so that people could understand them. Pictures in the sky, it's an ancient name, Mizenegizhik, the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. In our clan, the clan that I belong to, our family clan, is a clan of philosophers. Their responsibility, among other things, are to retain the teachings and understanding of the whole world, all of those things that we, as we understand them, and to help people come to a, a balanced understanding of everything, which is a real challenge. That's probably why I'm a judge. <laughs> I try to make people understand what's going on before I do something. And every single society of indigenous people have those questions in their teachings. Every single society of indigenous people. But not only do indigenous people have those questions, they're also in European society as well. <coughs> because I studied philosophy when I was in university, and Plato and Socrates wrote about those very same questions. They call them the big questions of life. And the biggest one is, who am I? Who am I? What is it that makes me unique in this world? What is it that makes us unique from all of the other things of creation? How do we relate to the rest of creation? What is our responsibility in this creation? It's part of that. And understanding that helps you helps you to be a better person, helps you to be a better father, better mother, better auntie, better uncle, better grandfather, better grandmother, helps you to be the best possible person because you understand those questions and you know when your children come to you and they say, how come I can't have my brother's cookie? You know how to answer it now because you know those answers. So those questions were taken away from our young people, denied to them for the longest time. And so I say to all of the survivors, many of them have come forward and they say, I was not abused in the schools the same way that these other people were. But I point out to them, you may not have been, but you were aware that they were being abused. You lived in that fear and that sense of oppression in the schools but also you lost access to the answers that those questions were so very important to. And for many, they've been able to find their way to do that. There's a lot of cultural reclamation going on among young Aboriginal people these days, led by some of our university graduates and those who are the generation after me. They're now beginning to look for those answers. They are beginning to wake up Prophecy of seven fires and the Ojibwe teachings are about those young people waking up and going to the elders, asking elders about these questions, many of whom can't tell them the answers because they themselves have been asleep during all of this and don't know. And so that needs to be understood, how important that is. But I want you to listen to these young people in this next video. 
because at each of our national events when we brought the survivors together, I said to them as kindly as I could, this is no longer about you. This is no longer about you, it's about your children. It's about your grandchildren. It's about your great-grandchildren. Because the question that we must ask ourselves now is, what can we do to help them? What can we do to help them to be able to answer those four questions for themselves? And so we bring together, we have brought together, young people at each of our national events. And they come in the thousands. We had 5,000 in Vancouver, we had 8,000 in Edmonton, we had 4,000 in Winnipeg. We bring them together to listen to survivors and to talk about what this means to them. And you will be impressed with what they have to say. I want you to listen to the BC youth, the ones who came to the British Columbia event, and you'll see what I mean. We know that among you are the future leaders of this country. Among you are those who are going to govern this land. Among you are those who are going to make important decisions about reconciliation. And you are going to have to come to terms with this history that you're going to hear a little bit about. And we know that's a difficult process, but it all starts with three things. You must watch, you must listen, and you must show respect. It's finally nice that we realize everything and we learn about it, what really happened. My grandparents, my mom, we been through this with that just us, so I just really wanted to know more about it. I've learned a lot, actually, considering that my grandma didn't tell me very much or anything. So I've learned what abuse they had to go through. I've learned when it started, how long it was for, when it ended. I've learned a lot. I want to learn about what happened to my dad when he was in residential school. And I want to learn the healing process and what will help with it. It makes me feel kind of sad kind of for those kids because they were kind of, it was torture, you know, it's not fair. They just, they took, like, they just took them away from their homes and they just hear what that so I just didn't agree with them. It's just really wrong. It makes me upset when I think about it because just knowing what, like, my dad and his mom had to go through, it was really hard, like, to deal with, I guess. I don't know. It bothers me a lot, and now I realize like why my dad drank so much when I was a little kid, I guess. It'll kind of change the way I think about things, like how it would like affect someone's life and their kids' life for like generations. That's one of the worst things that Canada kind of did. I hope events like this just are able to bring closure to a lot of horrible things that happened and I hope a lot of people now recognize that the crime happened and that we need to make amends for it. I'll never forget this day because th today is the first day they ever told us about where the dungeon schools and if I ever see anyone that's Aboriginal, I'll ask them if they can speak their language because I think speaking their language is a pretty cool thing. I like being around this. I like hearing the drums and seeing everybody else and learning about new nations and all the new languages I have not heard of yet. I think we should start a dance crew and start bringing back our culture, start speaking our language, and everyone should just treat each other equal. Our traditions carried on and passed down so that all our younger generations and so that my baby knows what happened in the past to her ancestors and so that she can just keep bringing our tradition forward and passing it on to her kids and their kids and everything. And I hope that something like this never happens again anywhere in the world and the importance of letting people know is so that it doesn't happen again and it's good for the younger generation to know that so that we all treat each other as equal.
One of the um, unknowns that we uh, were not aware of, or as aware of perhaps as we should have been, at the beginning of this whole process was how important it was to allow the young indigenous children, grandchildren and the children of the survivors, to listen to this so that they would be able to answer that question for themselves which was so important to them. Why are things like this? Why are things like this? Because they wanted to know the answer to that, otherwise they were only left with one possible answer and that answer was because there's something wrong with us. And we wanted them to know that there's nothing wrong with us. It's what was done to us that was wrong. And it began with the apologies that were given by those who had done the wrong. Churches began apologizing back in the 1980s. The government apologized in 2008 through the Prime Minister's apology. The other political leaders apologized for this past as well. But apologies are never enough. They're a beginning. They're just a start of things. It's like a domestic violence relationship. If you're married to somebody who abuses you emotionally, physically, and then they suddenly stop and say, I'm sorry for abusing you in the past. I won't do it again. That's a start. But if they still treat you poorly, they still treat you like you're inferior, if they still treat you like you don't have a brain and you treat you like you have no sense of self-determination, if they don't change their behavior, if they still hold on to that power that they have over you, whether it's economic power, or political power, or legal power, if they don't change that part of the relationship, that apology doesn't mean anything. That apology loses its meaning. And that's where we're at right now. Trying to convince the parties that something more needs to be done. And we have a long way to go. I want you to know that. As a commission, we're not kidding ourselves. We did not acknowledge the possibility that we might achieve reconciliation in the mandate of this commission. In fact, we told people, my very first public statement as a commissioner in 2009 to the Assembly of First Nations was, we will never achieve reconciliation in my lifetime. And we probably won't achieve it in the lifetime of my children. We may not even achieve it in the lifetime of my granddaughter. But what's important is that today we start to look at that behavior that needs to be changed and we start changing our behavior bit by bit. And it begins by changing the way that we talk to and about each other. It changes in the way that we teach our children about each other. And so as a commission we have brought our energies to bear upon the educational system. With an interesting if ironic perception, it was through the use of schools that we got into this mess. It's going to be through the use of schools that we're going to get out of this. And so I say to you, as citizens of this territory, with people who have an influence upon those who are going to make decisions about the education of children in this area, that you need to be able to support that. You need to be able to support it when your schools start to talk about changing the way that they teach children about the history of Canada, that they include this story so that everybody knows about it, so that everybody knows why things are the way they are. And if that's acceptable to people, that helps to answer an interesting problem that we identified at the beginning. What about the newcomers? What about the people who were not here when this all happened? What about the people who can say, I didn't do any of that, so why are you blaming me? The answer is simple. It's because you are part of the solution. You are part of the solution. You may not have been part of the problem, but you are part of the solution. And so you have to know this, you have to commit to saying that that was not right, and you have to be prepared to move together with those who are the victims of this past, including non-Aboriginal people as well. And 
I have said in the past, and I'll tell you this, this is not just an Aboriginal problem. All Canadians have been affected by this history. Because Aboriginal children who were placed in the schools were told that they were inferior, they were savages, they were heathens, that they were backward, they were uncivilized. That same message was taught in the public schools of Canada for a hundred years. And still is, in fact. You doubt it? Take a look at the dropout rates of Aboriginal children and ask yourself, why are they dropping out? Why are they not succeeding in these schools? They're just as smart as everybody else. Some of the most intelligent kids I've ever met are the Aboriginal kids who end up in gangs and end up in my court. Smarter than most kids I talk to in the schools. But they won't go to school because it doesn't give them what they want or what they need. And what they need are the answers to those four questions. The schools have to start giving them those answers too. It has to give it to them in a way that's relevant to them. And that's going to take some time, but it's going to take your support as we go forward. So I want you to know that all of this effort that we're making is not just about revealing the truth of the past. That's important. But it's about identifying a path to the future as well. And that path to the future is going to get us to a situation, we hope, where we can have mutual respect for each other, where we can understand why we are in this kind of relationship that we are in. We can understand why Indigenous people may not want to assimilate into Canada. They want to maintain their own unique existence, their own unique rights, and retain their language and their cultures, separate and apart from what Canada wants to achieve. We can understand why Aboriginal people don't want to forget about this past. They can't get over it. It's a common expression. It's like we can't get over the Second World War. We can't get over 9-11. We shouldn't. We should always remember. We should memorialize. We should make it part of who we are. Stand up proud for the fact that we have survived this. Survival in that sense means we have prevailed. We have won despite everything that has been done. And so that also speaks to the need for us to ensure that young Indigenous people in the future and feel self-respect as well, can be proud, can stand proud, are not ashamed of the color of their skin, or the name that they carry, the length of their hair, the color of their eyes, or the tribe that they belong to, or the things that are said in the history books, that they can lay claim to their part of this history as well. And we need to do that, because nobody owns this history. It belongs to all of us including the bad part. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that, as I said at the beginning, I hope that in some way I've made it worth your while for you to be here, and that you have been able to find something that you can carry forward with this as you go. Because remember, you are part of the solution. So take care of each other. Take care of your children and your grandchildren.